I'm Greg Johnston, CEO of Carl Data Solutions, an industrial Internet of Things company that provides big data solutions for monitoring critical infrastructure. Carl Data offers machine learning and predictive analytics features through our cloud-based applications to deliver key asset-saving operational insights from massive amounts of data. Carl Data trades on the CSE symbol CRL and the pink symbol CDTAF. For more details on Carl Data, please visit carlsolutions.com. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Chris Sims, BC Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Her website, Taxpayer.com. Welcome back to the show, Chris. Thank you so much for having me on. As we were speaking here in uh, the lower mainland of British Columbia, we're all choking from the forest fire smoke and we're wondering how we can prevent it and we're both wondering back during the Kelowna fires the government said it would spend so much money or had a plan to put fire breaks around BC communities but from what we can tell so far that never really happened and again cities and towns are either being evacuated or under threat of evacuation would it be wise use of taxpayer money to do more on prevention especially after Premier Horgan said this may be a normal state of affairs. You know, it's just, it's not acceptable, frankly, for a political leader to stand up and say that this is the new normal. You know, this, this is not the new normal. Uh, most people who have lived in British Columbia for more than a generation or two can recall how uh, different various uh, fire force, firefighters and government levels uh, have fought fires in the past, whether or not they tag in the military, if they bring in other people. And it, w- it wasn't like this, frankly. And I think a lot of people who are sitting under a blanket of smoke right now are wondering, can't they do a better job? And again, to stress, this is absolutely no knock against the actual firefighters who are on the ground trying to fight these things and those who are up in the air in the choppers. What we're uh, looking at here is the role of government. And is the government doing a good enough job uh, planning for, budgeting for, and coordinating this stuff Because just recently, for example, a reporting right now, according to the B.C. government, they've spent more than $282 million on these these forest fires. That's a lot of money. And so couldn't some of that money be put into better use into fire protection? And just speaking personally, you know, taking off my taxpayer's hat and putting on my B.C. citizen's hat here in the Fraser Valley, I don't know about you, but all of the message boards that I'm a member of on Facebook, Twitter, all that good stuff, are saying things like, why aren't we building fire breaks, like you mentioned, like they were planning around Kelowna? Why why is this not becoming mandatory to have fire breaks and to have uh, big, basically, moats of area that can't be burned around populated areas, around cities and towns? Because you're right, there's a lot of people sitting under evacuation alert and evacuation order. Uh, we can barely see the sun. It's the smoke is so thick. And frankly, they need to have a better approach because right now what they're doing it just isn't working well enough. Yes, and the B.C. government a few days ago declared a state of emergency, yet they're still not using one of the best pieces of firefighting equipment on the planet, the Martin Mars water bomber. It wasn't used last year, the worst forest fire year ever in B.C., and this one could repeat that same kind of statistic. Why aren't they using it? And uh, I you know, have yet to hear from the forestry industry. They say, oh, it's old. Well, you know, if you look back in history, it's based on Vancouver Island. And Vancouver Island, for 50 years, never had a major forest fire because it put them out before it got serious. And that's something, again, I see everywhere on these message boards and people writing in emails and that uh, to various newspapers around the province asking about this piece of equipment. Now, the jury's out on it, of course, depending on who you ask. There are some people who are split who say that, you know, the smaller planes are doing a better job than, you know, the big plane that dumped the big amount of water. But I think for a lot of people, like I was saying, who lived here, you know, a generation or two ago, they have fond memories of that piece of equipment working very well in various parts of the province. The question is, is how do we best use something like it? Do they use the Martin Mars? Uh, do we encourage other companies to build very similar vessels like that without turning it into a boondoggle. The risk there 
is that if the government starts deciding to build a plane that flies full of water, it just sounds like an accident or a disaster waiting to happen. Because unfortunately, when the government starts managing things like the building of fast cat ferries or the building of uh, replacement uh, pieces for Canadian Armed Forces, they don't do a good job. They have horrible cost overruns. It usually becomes a big spending boondoggle. And quite often, we wind up fudging it so much that we want not actually getting the vehicle that we wanted or that we paid for. And this is no knock against, you know, the men and women who actually do cut the steel and put these things together in aerospace and in shipbuilding. It's because the government is trying to manage something that private industry is better at doing. And so, frankly, we don't know why the government isn't using better equipment or more effective equipment or if that's what they're using right now, is that actually better? But I think from a common sense perspective, speaking practically as a lay, as a lay person, we're under a huge cloud of smoke and we've got a state of emergency. They have to figure out something better than this. And it comes right down to it's not okay for the premier to throw up his hands and say this could be the new normal. No, fight back, figure it out. Human beings are very smart. We're brilliant. We're able to come up with all sorts of innovative solutions. There has to be a better idea than this. We'll have more with Chris Sims right after the break. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Vatic Ventures Corp. is a potash exploration company focused on the Korat Basin in Thailand, the world's largest undeveloped potash resource. Vatic's management has extensive potash exploration and development experience in Thailand. Vatic will have marketing advantage compared to Western producers. Drill program commences this spring. Vatic trades on the TSX Venture, symbol VCV, and on Frankfurt, symbol V8V2. Visit our website, vaticventures.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Chris Sims. Chris, you just finished doing a tour of Vancouver Island. What are people concerned about there when it comes to taxes? So speaking with community leaders uh, across Vancouver Island, especially in concentrated in the Comox Valley, uh, both community leaders and ratepayers organizations, things like that, and as they were in the interior, they're getting hit hard by the high cost of fuel. Uh, British Columbia and most places in B.C. have often the highest cost of gasoline and diesel in the entire country. And when you get a place like Vancouver Island, of course, which is uh, more removed from the mainland and they depend on ferry service and uh, bo- uh, boats and planes in order to get all of their supplies, they really get hit hard by high cost of fuel as well. And we also keep in mind that if they have a high cost of fuel over there on the island, that it's not just the average private citizen who is paying through the nose for fuel, it's the municipalities. So cities and towns need to fuel up those fleets. They need to fuel up those rescue vehicles and those emergency services vehicles and all the maintenance vehicles that they own or that they lease. And all of that money, guess what, comes out of taxpayers' pockets, either in the form of property taxes or directly through their own uh, fuel taxes. And so that's why we're constantly encouraging the government to do what they can to reduce that spending load, to reduce that financial burden. We can't, unfortunately, change the price of oil and gas, but they can ease up on uh, the tax pedal, so to speak, take their foot off of it. So what they could do is they could get rid of the carbon tax, they could get rid of the federal excise tax, and they could get rid of the HST, which is a tax on all the other taxes. And if they did that in the province of British Columbia alone, that would save 25 cents per litre. That's a lot of dough when you add it up, fill up after fill up. And so that's one of the main things that they brought up with me. They also brought up the employer health tax. And so for a lot of people who perhaps just go to work every day and they're not employers, they might think this won't affect them. But that's not true because the employer health tax in the province of British Columbia also applies to cities and towns. Almost every city or town in BC, by default, has a payroll of more than $500,000. When you add up things like emergency services, maintenance, etc., it's easy to get over a $500,000 threshold. That's the limit where it starts kicking in. And guess what? Cities and towns can't run deficits. That's a good thing. 
but they need to find that money now somewhere. And in many cases, a lot of these cities and towns are going to have to try to put that tax burden onto property tax holders. And even if you rent, a lot of us can't afford to own a house here. If you rent, your landlord is going to start paying higher property taxes because of the employer health care tax. And guess what? You're going to see a rental increase. So no matter what, this money never, ever disappears. The bill always comes due. And what has happened here is the province, Victoria, the NDP government, has foisted part of health care funding onto the backs of cities and towns with not so much as a question or a thank you. We'll have more with Chris Sims right after this. I'm Kelly Jennings, CEO of PowerVan Solutions. PowerVan is a cloud-based provider of auction, inventory, and finance solutions that make buying, selling, and financing vehicles more efficient. PowerVan Solutions trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol PBX and on the OTCQB symbol PWWBF and on Frankfurt symbol 1ZV. For more information, please visit us at PowerBandSolutions.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Chris Sims. Uh, Chris, going back to the... Uh, the uh, health care tax that employers will have to pay. Do hospital workers or hospitals have to pay that tax as well on their employees? Pretty much everything outside of a not-for-profit will have to pay it. So whether or not a hospital would technically fall under that, that's a good question. But the B.C. government, for example, is ironically a very big employer, and they obviously um, have a big payroll, and they're going to be paying part of this tax back in on itself. It's like that image that we have from ancient times of the snake eating its own tail. So, yeah, in many cases, uh, government agencies, uh, including the provincial government and various uh, local and municipal governments, they'll be paying the tax as well. Whether that applies directly to a hospital, that's a good question, because I think technically they would be described as a not-for-profit, but it's something I could definitely check into. They just recently changed uh, the new law saying that not-for-profits, so charities, things like that, will be exempt but they haven't exempted cities and towns. What about school boards? They are looking into that as well. So I think that that also applies under the not-for-profit, but they are really, really hitting the cities and towns hard. And it's something that the cities and towns are trying to team up and uh, fight back against. You know, frankly, we don't have a lot of data on paper here. A lot of this stuff is up in the air, and they're making it up as they go along. Uh, They call it through consultation. But as far as the actual specifics go, it's actually a difficult thing to attack right now because they're giving us very little information. Kinder Morgan Pipeline, the federal government now officially owns it. Who's going to supervise the construction that has mostly now been approved by the National Energy Board? Unfortunately, it's up to the federal government in many cases, and hopefully they will be able to contract out some of these uh, building sites and these supervisory positions to companies that know what they're doing. And so let's hope that they're able to do that and they don't start cherry-picking, playing favorites, dragging their feet, going through endless consultative processes that they've already done many times over over the past five years. We're worried that that's what's going to happen because, unfortunately, when the government tries to build something, they don't usually do it efficiently or well. So we're bracing ourselves there. And what was also disturbing uh, just today, hearing from Premier Horgan when he was asked again about the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which he wrongheadedly is opposing, what's interesting is that he was asked by reporters, so what are the feds doing? What are the feds talking to you about? And he said, he said the federal government has not been pitching him, meaning appealing to him as a provincial leader, about what their oceans protection plan means or what any of this extra money, our money, that they're ponying up actually means. So the idea that that the federal government is not in constant and intensive talks with the provincial government explaining all of this as they move along, as they get this thing rolling, is heartbreaking because it shows a lack of initiative, it shows a lack of commitment, and there's billions of dollars on the line here. And frankly, the feds just don't seem to care, and we need them to care. Do you think that uh, the problems with Saudi Arabia will convince Eastern Canada that the pipeline 
to the east should be built? That's a great question. And, you know, I think in many cases, those who are uh, hard-boiled against it uh, will still be hard-boiled against it, no matter what. Frankly, we were getting our some of our oil from Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. Um, many people call it conflict oil. And they couldn't give a flying fox fart back when the uh, Energy East was being proposed, and they opposed it anyway. You know, the mayor of Montreal at the time, uh, Denis Coderre, um, fully knew all of that. He's a smart man. He's worked in federal politics for most of his life, so he's well aware of all of that. He didn't care. Uh, this is the same, keep in mind, that the jurisdiction of Montreal, uh, who says that they're so concerned about the environment, is the same jurisdiction that dumps thousands and thousands of liters of raw sewage into the St. Lawrence River. You know, it's the, hypocr- the, the hypocrisy here is really choking. And I need to stress that Energy East, for example, very similar to the Kinder Morgan pipeline. Kinder Morgan pipeline, the route's already there. They're just twinning it. So it's not like they're breaking new ground or anything. They're just putting it right alongside of the existing one, which if you go to take a look at Kinder Morgan Pipeline as it exists right now, it's a long, narrow, grassy glade with yellow sticks that stick up, kind of similar to how people will warn that there's a a rock or a fire hydrant in high snow. It's just these yellow plastic sticks out of the ground among like literally wildflowers and grass. So they want to twin that. Take a look at Energy East. That's already built from the oil sands all the way across the prairies, all the way through most of Ontario, right out to the eastern edge of a place called Cornwall, Ontario, which is right next to the Quebec border. So the only part that needs to be built new for Energy East was this tiny spur from Cornwall in eastern Ontario across the bottom part of Quebec and out into New Brunswick to St. John. But they still opposed it and they still killed it. And if we can't do that, if we can't build a tiny spur onto an existing pipeline for oil sands oil, which has some of, you know, the best environmental record, the best labor laws around, then I'm worry, really worried about Canada's energy future when it comes to the economy because we should be a big world player. People should be ponying up to buy our oil because we're such a good country. But instead, we can't even get that right. And people are buying it hand over fist from places like Saudi Arabia. Could the politicians in Quebec be uh, bribed or bought off by Arab oil interests to say what they're saying? I mean, I'm not saying they are, but they do have a history of being in the pocket of somebody. You know, that's a very interesting question, and I really mean that, because it's something that needs a lot more of investigative journalism. And as both you and I know, the nature of journalism and broadcasting in newsrooms has changed a lot. And unfortunately, we just often don't have the people. We don't have the bodies. The bench isn't deep enough in some cases uh, on the journalism team to dig into this. But we do hear from independent researchers like Vivian Krauss, for example, who digs into things like the Tides Foundation. So the Tides Foundation is basically, uh, to summarize, an American-based organization. Most of your listeners will know this. But what they may not know is that they get a lot of their money, their funding, from the Rockefeller Group. The Rockefeller Group, of course, was founded by Rockefeller himself, who founded Standard Oil. Standard Oil is a giant in American energy. What's happened now, though, is that the descendants of Rockefeller, the grandchildren and great-grandchildren, are so appalled by their ancestors' starting of an energy company, uh, an oil and gas company, that they're selling the farm that they're handing over as much money as they can to anti-oil groups. But usually, this is a funny catch, usually just to uh, campaigns against things like Canadian oil. They probably give money away to other organizations in other democratic countries. But keep in mind that a lot of it would be very easy to have Saudi oil money get lo- get filtered through these uh, various organizations completely legally. This is completely legal in the United States. But what's really interesting is that in the United States, as a charitable organization, they must declare their their big amounts of funding. So they're they're big donors. They have to list it. And if you know what you're doing, and researchers like Vivian Krauss do, you can trace this money back. And so, yes, uh, long story short, in some cases, you will see foreign money interests, often backed by foreign oil, including places like Saudi Arabia, influencing campaigns on the ground. 
I, I experienced this when I was a reporter with Sun News. Uh, one of my colleagues was going to cover a pipeline protest for it was a, it was a pipeline, and your listeners will shake their heads. It was called Line Nine. Okay, it was just some pipeline that was literally already in the ground. Okay, all they were doing was reversing the flow of oil. Say it used to go east west. The company was simply going to reverse the flow to go west-east. That's it. They weren't digging in the ground. They weren't doing anything else. They had instantaneous protesters there with matching T-shirts and full-color picket signs, all matchy-matchy with their hats and everything. They knew exactly how to talk to the media. Where are these people coming from to literally protest something that they can't even see? It's in the ground. So, yeah, unfortunately, a lot of times there's money behind a lot of this, and it isn't in Canadians' best interests. Is BC Premier John Horgan right to say if the pipeline is twinned from Edmonton to the Vancouver area, it won't lower gasoline prices? Is he correct? I don't think he's correct. And I, I say that because we speak frequently with the gas and oil specialist, Dan McTagg, with GasBuddy.com. And he has explained very carefully, very thoroughly, how it will increase capacity to refineries here on the West Coast, both in British Columbia and in Washington State. And so his argument, and again, he's the expert on this, he says that it will lower the cost of gasoline. Now, whether it will lower it dramatically, we don't know. But we do know that it will provide tens of thousands of excellent paying jobs and that uh, Kinder Morgan, in this case, is a huge, it sounds funny, property tax payer. So Kinder Morgan pays so much in property taxes, for example, in the area around Burnaby, that if they expand their operations just physically there, forget the pipeline itself, expansions of their own operations that are already existing in the Burnaby area, apparently the property tax hikes that they that they get will pay for garbage collection for a year. Like, these these companies are so big and they contribute so much to the tax base that it's almost hard to measure sometimes. So, frankly, I you know we don't think that the Premier is right. We think that part of the reason why we're paying such a high gasoline price in British Columbia, especially in the Lower Mainland, is often because of the opposition to things like the Kinder Morgan pipeline. And, frankly, it can only help. It can't hurt. Twinning it can't hurt the price of gas. It could only help it. And the Premier is well within his power to cancel the carbon tax. He should do that on BC fuel, and he'd be saving people a lot of money. Chris, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you very much for caring. And just a reminder for people that these people work for you. These politicians that you see, if they're elected or not, if they're working for TransLink, if they're working in Victoria, you pay their wages, and so they need to answer to you. And so no matter what your political stripe, doesn't matter who you vote for, always stand up and be heard. It is your right and, in some cases, your responsibility in a democracy. My guest has been Chris Sims, B.C. Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Her website, taxpayer.com. You're listening to the Goddard Report on TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our YouTube channel is TalkDigitalNetwork. Questions for the show or our guests can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.